So today I wanted to speak with you about some of the work that we've been doing developing lipid nanoparticles for targets outside of the liver. And I specifically wanted to focus on some of our data regarding delivery to the pancreas. So just a little bit about my lab in general, and Dr. Collis had mentioned this in the introduction, we work in a couple of different areas of drug delivery. So we focus on the oral delivery of protein medications, so drugs like insulin that currently have to be injected and trying to find ways of delivering them in more patient-friendly forms. So that might involve oral delivery for proteins. The problem with proteins is that they're digested by our gastrointestinal tracts. And so we're very interested in studying the transport of these large molecules across the gastrointestinal tract to facilitate these uh, more patient-friendly means of delivering proteins. More recently, my lab has uh, taken interest in women's and infant health. I had my first pregnancy at this point about seven years ago, and then another one shortly before the pandemic happened. And there's nothing like firsthand experience to realize that uh, the state of maternal medicine is rather poor. And there are a lot of things that we can do to try to improve our understanding of transport processes during pregnancy to try to create medications that are safe, that do not cross into the infant. And then finally, the subject of today's lecture is in this area of RNA delivery, where I've been working now on lipid nanoparticles for over 15 years. And it's just been wonderful to see how far this field has come since I first started. My lab is especially interested in how manipulating the chemistry of these particles, which are quite complex chemically, how those manipulations can affect their functionality in vivo, both in terms of biodistribution, where they're working well, immunogenicity and toxicity. So I'll speak a bit more about that today. So as pretty much all of you probably know at this point, these RNA therapies have gone from niche to mainstream. So the first FDA approval of a lipid nanoparticle formulation and the first FDA approval of an RNA drug was back in 2018 by Al Nylum, and they developed this medication for a rare type of liver disease. And this was wonderful, and it brought to fruition you know, decades of research on liposomal and lipid nanoparticle type materials. But even then, we still had a very small population of people who were benefiting from this type of technology. And people were quite cautious about, you know, using these types of medications for you know, larger patient populations. So then we had this awful occasion to need to put these materials to the test. And I think all of us in the delivery field were absolutely delighted to see how well these materials and how well RNA therapies can work in you know, huge numbers of people. And so now with this evidence and hundreds of millions of people that this technology works well, this is really going to open the floodgates to all sorts of new therapies, not just in vaccines, but in protein replacement, uh, gene editing and otherwise. <clears throat> so for any trainees in the audience who are a little bit less familiar with this, I wanted to just go through some of the basic molecular biology that underpins all this RNA work that we're doing. So this is the central dogma of molecular biology that tells us that our permanent blueprint, the DNA inside of our cells, this is transcribed into a temporary copy called messenger RNA which is then translated in the cell cytoplasm into proteins. And proteins are the doers in our body. And because they're the molecules responsible for all function, many diseases are caused by misregulated proteins. So either the protein is non-functional, either we have too much of a particular protein or too little. And so to treat disease, we really need to manipulate protein expression such that it goes back to what it's supposed to be. 
So that first FDA approved drug, it contained short interfering RNA. And it's short because it's about 21 base pairs in length as opposed to RNA, mRNA, which can be thousands long. And it interferes with protein production. So you can design this so it would be specific for a target gene of interest. And then you can have reductions in that protein expression. If we want to upregulate protein expression instead of downregulate, that's where messenger RNA comes in. And so we can design mRNAs that can, for example, give us more of a particular gene of or protein of interest. And in the case of the vaccines, it's just super cool. We can ask our bodies to generate proteins that our bodies would never normally make. So in this case, it's generating the spike protein, which is not native to mammalian cells. So very powerful technology. I wanted to speak very briefly on our news this week that the Nobel Prize was given for the mRNA biology that underpinned the COVID-19 vaccines. So RNA therapeutics really require two parts. So one is functional mRNA that once it goes inside the cell, it can produce the protein of interest effectively. And then the other is the delivery system, which I think hasn't gotten quite as much press as the RNA itself, but is equally important. So today I'll be talking about the delivery system and uh, the Nobel Prize had to do with this mRNA biology. So here are the two people who have just been awarded. So Carrico and Weissman, who originally did the work at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. So they, um, I like to just tell people they're both really terrific people. I think we don't always have, um, you know, sometimes famous scientists aren't uh, the best models of, of collaboration. It's been my privilege to collaborate with Drew over the years. When I was getting started in the mRNA field, it was back in 2017, and RNA is quite expensive if you purchase it. And I was giving a seminar at Penn, and Drew was a stranger to me, and we had a meeting, and he offered to make me whatever mRNA I wanted and send it to me. And People didn't believe too much in RNA therapies at that time. There was still a lot of hesitation. So I was taken aback and confused why a stranger would offer to help me in this way, given the expense. So it took me a couple of years to actually approach him. And then when I did, he was true to his word and he's provided me with, with RNA since that time uh, and has otherwise been a great collaborator. I've also met Katie Carrico briefly and she's given me some nice advice so just such a pleasure to see good people um, reward it for, for their work. So um, in terms of what they did, they discovered that base modifications of RNA are needed for protein translation in mammals. So here is the molecule uridine, which is one of those canonical nucleic acids that are present in RNA. And the problem when we make RNA typically with these uh, molecules such as uridine is that our cells recognize them as foreign. And that's because our cells make RNA to incorporate some base modifications. So if it sees RNA without base modifications, it mounts a bit of an immune response that shuts down protein production. So that's part of why nobody thought RNA therapies would become a reality because uh, when we made RNA in the lab and introduced it, it just would not make protein. So what they found was that they could make modifications to these different nucleobases. And so here's um, one version of this. This is um, N1-methyl pseudouridine. The ones that are used in the vaccines are just called pseudouridine. And so we have these modifications and the cells are more willing to recognize these externally introduced RNAs as self, and then they are willing to produce that protein. So all of the work that I'm showing you today is made with RNA that's been base modified so that it works well. 
So in terms of delivery barriers, <clears throat> excuse me, so <clears throat> to go back to the delivery vehicle part of the equation, RNA is large. It's uh, on the order of 100,000 grams per mole. It's negatively charged, and so it doesn't readily cross negatively charged cell membranes. And if you were to inject it into the bloodstream, it would be both degraded and quickly cleared from our system. So we need a vehicle that's going to package it up and protect it and take it to the cells of interest. So this diagram depicts a couple of uh, barriers that it needs to overcome if we were to do IV injection. So once it's injected into the bloodstream, it needs to avoid clearance by macrophages. Once it exits the bloodstream, it needs to diffuse through the tissue of the organ that you want to target. It then needs to be uptaken into the cell of interest. And this happens through a process called endocytosis, where the cell membrane reaches up and around that particle and it brings it inside. And so at this point, the nanoparticle is in this walled off compartment and the cell keeps it there because it's not sure what it is. And it looks and says, is this something I want? And typically a lipid nanoparticle is not on its wish list. So the endosome begins to acidify and would otherwise degrade these lipid nanoparticles. So part of the design of the chemistry behind these particles is that they need to mediate this process of endosomal escape. And that's one of the most difficult parts of this process. So once the RNA is into the cell cytoplasm, that's when it can interface with the protein translational machinery and make our protein of interest. <clears throat> So years ago, we asked if we could develop a potent and degradable RNA delivery system, potent for obvious reasons and degradable because many of these therapeutics will need to be repeat dosed. Uh, we will not necessarily create a cure, but a treatment, and we don't want this material building up over time. <clears throat> So the materials that we work with in my lab, they're lipid-like materials. We call them lipidoids, and they're a variation of the cationic lipids that have been used for decades at this point for different types of nucleic acid delivery. Uh, first, a lot of the work was done in the DNA delivery field. So here's one of these cationic lipids. If you were to put it into aqueous medium, you would find that they would assemble into these liposomal structures where we have the hydrophilic head group on the outside of the particle facing uh, the aqueous media. And then we would have these um, hydrophobic tails on the inside and you can load then hydrophilic drugs into the interior. So we wanted to make something like this to hold on to our RNA. And we also wanted to generate materials where we could look at a lot of different chemistries and try to understand how the chemistry of these lipidoids would affect their functionality and try to derive structure function relationships from that. So we use a high throughput type of chemistry called Michael addition in which we take an alkylamine so we need some combination of say primary amines or secondary amines, and we would react them with alkyl acrylate tails here. It's an easy reaction. You put the two together in a scintillation vial. There's no solvent. You can mix them for a couple of days at high temperature. And out the other side comes something that's not too dissimilar from uh, this cationic lipid up here. So we can vary the chemistry of both this amine and the tail to generate large numbers of materials. The degradability comes in from the use of these acrylate materials with which result in an ester in the final form of these lipids and those esters degrade under physiological conditions. So these lipids are ionizable meaning that under reduced pH conditions, as we form these particles, they are going to have this nice electrostatic interaction with the negatively charged RNA, which will help to catalyze the formation of these particles. So the particles are made through a nanoprecipitation process in which we need rapid mixing. 
So we have rapid mixing of two streams to form our nanoparticles, one of which is going to be RNA that's in a saline solution. And then we have a variety of lipids that are dissolved in ethanol and they are rapidly mixed. You can use microfluidic devices, tea mixers, and you can also use pipettes, which are relatively straightforward. Pipettes are not appropriate for scale up or anything like that, but they work well in the lab when you don't have a lot of money for, for microfluidic systems. So you mix these two streams together and you get materials that, um, you know, you have, you have lipids both on the exterior of the particle, like we had with liposomes, but you also have lipids throughout the material. So in terms of the ingredients in these particles, they include the ionizable lipid or lipidoid that I just told you about. This tends to be where a lot of the IP is in the lipid nanoparticle space. Many labs or companies attempt to create their own chemistry and intellectual property with these synthetic materials. They also contain helper lipids. So these are often phospholipids that naturally occur in our cell membrane. They can help with stability of the particles and also their ability to help with endosomal escape. We have a lot of cholesterol in these particles, which adds stability and uh, prevents the particles from falling apart. Very similar to the way we have a lot of cholesterol in our cell membranes, we would all be piles of goo if it were not for our cholesterol and our particles would be too. Then we have our polyethylene glycol lipid. So the lipid anchor here will insert on the inside of the particle. And then we have polyethylene glycol, which is a hydrophilic polymer, which decorates the outside of the particle. Uh, it can quench that nanoparticle formation process, so help us obtain particles of a nice size. It can also improve stability and decrease the amount of unwanted immune cell uptake that we get. So over the years, we've made and screened thousands of these ionizable lipidoids for RNA delivery, and we found a number that we really like, and we've used them for numerous applications. So here's one of our favorite lipidoids that we use in my lab. It's a four-tailed lipidoid. It has a couple of these nitrogen groups which help it protonate in the endosome and endosome doing end endosomal escape. We have our esters here for degradability. And then these materials are interesting because they have these branch tails and the branch tails seem to uh, change the structure of these lipids so that they can interface with endosomal uh, membranes differently and aid that fusion and escape process. So this is a great lipid. And so the work I'm going to show you today, all of it involves this ionizable lipid. So standard nanoparticles where the state of the field is at this point is that we can achieve delivery to a couple of locations. So the liver has been the easiest location. I don't wanna say it's easy, but it's been the easiest because when you inject particles, the liver is the organ that will naturally clear them from the bloodstream. And that first FDA approved product was to treat a liver condition. We also are capable of vaccination. So delivery to the immune cells and the muscle cells within the muscle tissue to mount the immune response that we need. But the question really is, as we're thinking about the future of RNA therapies is how we will deliver these materials beyond the liver. So as you can imagine, most of the diseases in the body are outside of the liver and there are many different places we'd like to go. So my lab works on delivering these materials to a couple of these particular organs. And today I'll be talking mostly about our ability to deliver to the pancreas. So for this work, uh, we're going to be focusing on swapping out the helper lipids in these particles and looking at how the influence of helper lipid charge in particular can direct these particles to different cell types. So there have been a couple of people who have reported the influence of charge. Uh, 
um, on the delivery process. So Dan Siegward's lab was one of the first to show that changing the charge, either cationic or negative compared to some of the neutral helper lipids can shift delivery from the liver to either the spleen or the lungs. And we found something similar in our lab so in this case, um, I'm showing you, so DOPE is the standard phospholipid that we use in my lab. It carries a net neutral charge. And you can see if we look at organ distribution of protein expression, so that's uh, the blue and purple signal here, you can see that we have expression in the liver and a bit in the spleen. Um, it's more it's more in the liver than the spleen just because the liver is larger. So here is the quantified signal where we're looking at luminescence expression, uh, which is a model protein that we were trying to create. So here we have mostly liver and a little bit in the spleen. And then if we change our helper lipid to DOPS, which is a negatively charged lipid, you can see now that we have improved delivery in the spleen, some shifts there. Whereas if we include a positively charged helper lipid, now we have significant shifts to the lung tissue. So this is just evidence that the charge of these materials can be quite influential. And this is just one of the, the molecules out of four types of lipids that are present in these particles. So we wanted to know if we could use a similar approach in our delivery to the pancreas. So we're going to manipulate two parameters to try to get good delivery to the pancreas. One is that chemistry, so specifically the helper lipid and its charge. And the other is the route of administration. So you can imagine that depending on where you are injecting materials into the body, they're going to go different places. So we are going to swap out some of the typical IV injections for intraperitoneal injections, which is into the cavity that holds the liver and the pancreas and some other organs. So for all of our experiments here that I'm going to show you today, we're looking at the expression of a model protein, so firefly luciferase, and we're able to visualize protein expression if we have good delivery. So our mRNA encodes firefly luciferase. We'll put that into our particles. We will deliver them into mice. And then a few hours later, we'll be able to take out their organs and to image them for luminescence uh, expression. So here, what I'm showing you first is if we take some of our favorite particles and we deliver them IV, and this is with the neutral helper lipid. And you can see, as I showed you before, that most of our expression is in the liver. What my postdoc found when she quantified this was a very small amount of expression in the pancreas. So note, this is a exponential scale here. Uh, so 10 to the seventh versus, you know, um, a couple of order, orders of magnitude more in the liver. But she noticed there was a little something. And she wondered if she could turn that little something into something more substantial. So the first thought was, okay, let's change our route of administration and let's deliver these same particles uh, um, intraperitoneal injection. And you can see here that we do have some shifts away from the liver and into the pancreas. And if we quantify this here, you can see the pancreas expression has jumped up an order of magnitude and we do see some reductions in the amount of liver expression that we have. And the overall efficacy is a bit lower. This total bar is a bit lower, but if our goal is to deliver to the pancreas, that's not a problem. So then she wondered about the charge of that helper lipid. So here again are her data with the overall net neutral helper lipid which uh, when she delivers at IP, we have quite a bit in the pancreas. Then if she swaps this out for a negatively charged helper lipid, we don't really see significant changes there. There's certainly not more in the pancreas. If anything, there's a little less. And then if she uses a positive helper lipid instead, you can see something interesting happens. 
So we, we have the same amount of expression in the pancreas, but what we've done is, is to almost, um, you know, not completely, but we've significantly reduced the amount of expression in the liver. And so this is really nice because ultimately if we want to uh, do things in the pancreas, you usually don't also want to manipulate protein expression in the liver. So it's nice if we can do something more targeted. So just to summarize what we've been able to do with these uh, two different manipulations, if we have IV injection of our neutral helper lipid, we have less than 1% of signal in the pancreas. If we change that to IP administration, now we have 15% in the pancreas. And if we then swap that neutral helper lipid out for something that's positively charged, now we've flipped the ratio of pancreas to lip, liver and we have about 60%. So our next question uh, was where in the pancreas was this expression occurring? And what my postdoc found was that interestingly, it's occurring in the islet cells. So the islet cells are not a whole lot of the total tissue. I forget what it is, but it's less than 10% of total pancreas tissue are these islets, which contain both alpha and beta cells. And so what I'm showing you here is some staining of luciferase expression. So these are our control mice, which have not received lipid nanoparticles and you can see that they don't have any brown signal, which would correspond to luciferase expression. And now this is the treated sample, and you can see that the islets are expressing a lot of this luciferase. There's also some outside here in the acinar tissue as well. And if we quantify um, how, how important these beta cells are for protein expression, we see that they are predominantly responsible for the protein expression. So here, if we look at wild type mice, we have a certain amount of protein expression around 10 to the eighth. And then if you treat these mice with STZ, which is a molecule that will deplete beta cells in the body, you can see that we have about an order of magnitude reduction in the signal that we have in the animal suggesting that most of the protein expression is occurring in these beta cells. So how on earth is this happening? Um, how are we transfecting these islets? It's, it would be very strange if the particles were penetrating the outer capsule of the pancreas. My collaborator, who's a pancreatic surgeon, says, you know, that's quite unlikely. So we wanted to understand more about how this was happening. And what my postdoc did first is she looked at the biodistribution of these particles in the peritoneal cavity. So she used a fluorescently labeled mRNA. So it was labeled with a red dye and she isolated different cell types. So B cells, T cells, and macrophages. And she looked at where these particles were accumulating. And what she found was that they did not enter T cells, but they were entering B cells and macrophages. So this is not complete delivery. We're not looking at protein expression here. We're looking at which cells took up these particles. So since both B cells and macrophages took up the particles, she then asked if either one of these were involved in the process. So here is an efficacy experiment in which she has wild type mice and she compared the expression of luciferase here in our wild type mice to mice in which those B cells have been depleted. And what we see is no difference in expression. So this suggests that the B cells are taking up the particles, but they're not producing protein. However, we see something different with the macrophages in the peritoneal cavity. When we use a molecule that depletes these macrophages, we see about an order of magnitude reduction in the expression that we're getting, suggesting that macrophages are very important for this delivery process. And as we dug a little bit deeper, uh, we wondered how macrophages were involved. 
So there is some literature showing the process of, or the concept of horizontal gene transfer by which cells in our body, macrophages in particular, can put out extracellular vesicles that contain RNA and some other materials and can transfer those as a type of communication to other cells that are nearby. And we wondered if these extracellular vesicles might have some kind of role in this process. So we did a rather complex experiment. I'm going to try to walk you through it. So again, we have particles that are expressing our luciferase um, or containing our luciferase mRNA. We're going to inject them intraperitoneally into mouse number one. And then after a little bit of time goes past, we're going to do a peritoneal wash. So that's where you introduce some saline into the intraperitoneal cavity, and then you pull it out and it's going to contain the immune cells that are in that IP space. So we'll take that wash and we'll put them into a cell culture dish. And then we are going to allow these cells to produce extracellular vesicles which will bud off of them into the media, and then we will collect them. Okay, so now we have these EVs from the immune cells that are in mouse number one that have been treated with LMPs. We take these EVs and we inject those intraperitoneally into mouse number two. So this mouse has not seen any lipid nanoparticles, it's just seen these extracellular vesicles. And then we do imaging to look at this luciferase expression. And the results we found are quite interesting. So we see that these EV treated mice, so those are mouse, uh, are mice number two, they do not have statistically significant differences in delivery compared to our lipid nanoparticle treated mice, although the averages here are a bit, um, we might have you know, the averages about two times. Uh, that of these EV treated mice. So it's really very interesting that these EVs seem to be responsible for at least part of the delivery that we're seeing to the pancreas. And uh, as next steps, we're going to try to figure out how exactly that's happening and why. So finally, I'll just share a little bit of safety data. I always like to say when it comes to looking at immune responses and the toxicity. There are lots of different ways that toxicity can happen. And we've looked at only a subset of those measures. And so more testing is always needed. In this case, we've looked at after our injections of these particles, we look at some innate cytokines that can be expressed. And we don't want to see significant differences there for the most part. Um, and certainly not elevation of these inflammatory cytokines. Then we also looked at antibody expression for IgG and IgM, and we don't see any significance there after injection either. We also did some histology of all of these pertinent organs and compared to our PBS controls, we don't see significant differences in um, the tissue or infiltration of immune cells. So encouraging for now, but as I said, there's always more work to be done. So in summary, what I've shown you today is that we can take our favorite ionizable lipid and we can formulate particles in which we tune both the helper lipid charge and the route of administration to deliver RNA to the pancreas. Um, and it seems that the islets are where most of the protein expression is happening. And then we see that peritoneal macrophages are doing something very interesting to help in this process, um, perhaps by engaging in this horizontal gene transfer mediated by extracellular vesicles. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the members of my group and particularly the people who were the most hands-on with this work. So Sam Lepresti was the postdoc who looked at some of our initial charged helper lipid work uh, in the spleen and lungs. And then the bulk of the work I showed you today was performed by Jillian Melamed, who, uh, so this is Jillian and this is Sam. And then 
our collaborator, George Giddis, who's at the University of Pittsburgh, he's been a huge help. He's a pancreatic surgeon and was able to assist us with some of our experiments. Um, so uh, then I'll just mention that I had the privilege of giving a TED Talk a couple of years ago. So if any of you want to see a, a lay version of some of what I've described here, you can find that. Uh, they're called fat balls for the purposes of uh, SciComm to lay audiences. And then for those of you who are online, I am on the app formerly known as Twitter. And I'm also now on a platform called Blue Sky, if anyone wants to follow me there. So thanks again very much for the invitation. And it's my pleasure to take any questions you have. This question is, are LNPs stimulating the EV production? Have other particles been studied in your group? So this is a very good question and something that we find very interesting. So what we think might be happening is when these lipid nanoparticles are taken into these cells and uh, eventually as the endosome is going to do whatever it does with them and hopefully allow some of them to escape, those lipids are going to be recycled and put out of the cell. And some of the pathways that that recycling can occur is uh, similar to where or related to where these extracellular vesicles are formed. And so one of the things that we would think could be happening is that some of these ionizable lipids are actually being repackaged into EVs, which might help with this delivery process, but we have to uh, figure that out. All right, thank you. So the speaker list is growing. We have Drew Patel next, then Dr. Peter Collis, Gilbert Walker, and then we'll go back to Stephen Street on the Q&A. So Dhruv Patel, would you like to read your question out in person? It will take me a moment to uh, locate him in the list of participants and unmute him. Just give me a sec. All right. If you unmute yourself and you wish to speak, Dhruv, you should be able to now. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, 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 yeah. Hi. So... Uh, so the work was very interesting and just uh, like I would like to know the screening process of the lipidoids which you use. So chemistry point of view, so what you started with and uh, like how you screened it uh, like chem uh, based on we talk about the chemistry of the lipidoids. Sure. So I had showed we worked with the alkyl amines and we would react those with the alkyl tails so or the alkyl acrylate tails. So over the years, we've probably looked at 200 to 300 different amines, which we've reacted with many different tail types. So the tails uh, probably on the order of 25 or 30 different tail types. Um, we started with things that are commercially available, but then through the years, as we've learned more about structure function relationships, we've done some custom synthesis to try to incorporate new chemistries in both those amines and in the tail groups. So at the end of the day, you know, we had thousands of these particles um, for the purposes of in vitro screening. So we do the initial screening in cell culture. We do not purify these for initial cell culture screening. That would just not be possible because the purification takes a while. And so then we will make the, the lipid nanoparticles. You can make lipid nanoparticles with pipetting in 96 well plates. And um, yeah, you kind of brute force go through and you can screen them. So in vitro testing is only, it, it's not terribly predictive of what we see in animals. But at the very least, we can screen out things that don't work at all in, um, you know, because that's not going to work in an animal either. Does that make sense? Does it answer yeah, your question? Yeah, 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 very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Peter Collins. Peter, go ahead. Uh, sure, a very nice lecture, Katie. The, 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 um, one thing about on the um, lipidoids, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the original lipidoids like C12, 200, et cetera, I mean, we were actually uh, in, in direct competition with the Langer group at that point 
uh, with the um, you know the MC3 and uh, so on. One of the issues with the C12-200 was toxic was toxicity uh, compared to the. Um, so I just wonder if you comment on that on on the toxicity of the lipidoids versus say some of the other lipids such as the MC3 or some of the mm -hmm. lipids that are now in the vaccines. Sure. So the problem with C12-200, um, at least in my opinion, is that it's not degradable. So, you know, that, that can be one reason for some of the toxicity that we see. Uh, not all of the toxicity is super acute. So some of it happens over slightly longer time periods. Um, and what I mean is not within hours, but a little bit longer time period. So that's a problem with C12-200. It also, I mean, it works fine, but it doesn't work quite as well as some other lipids, I think, in the area. So the material that we work with, depending on the route of administration, you know, we can do 10 or 15 fold more than, than uh, C12-200. Uh, MC3 can do better as well. MC3, as you know, is uh, an incredibly, uh, you know, it, it's, it's generally a well-tolerated lipid. So it's a good starting point. Um, and that's why it's in an FDA approved product. Yeah, I mean, that's the issue, I think, with developing some of these newer chemistries is that you know, there's a big burden of, of proof as to how it's going to be better than some of the things that are already established. So these other lipids uh, that are in the FDA approved products, they, you know, it's okay if they cause a little bit more immunity um, or immune responses. And I know that you know this, but perhaps other people don't. Those materials were created not because they were the best at delivering to the liver, but because they were the best for a vaccine applications in which can even use these lipids to have a bit of an adjuvant-like effect. Sure. Okay, Thanks. Thank you. The next question was from Gilbert Walker. Go ahead, Dr. Walker. Yeah, thanks. I really enjoyed your talk. In some ways, my, my, my um, question is related to Peter's in the sense that there was, in fact, an immune response for the, the, the MC3s that went into the lipid. And if you go through the the regulatory documents, you can see sort of why they decided it was okay. Um, right. And I guess, I guess, um, you know, in the case of the vaccines, as you say, it was an advantage actually, um, or it could have been an advantage. So I'm wondering where, where is the break point? That's a generic question. When you go through regulatory, if you are trying to prepare yourself to go through regulatory, what do you, what, you know, you're trying to prepare for a clinical trial. What do you think is the break point, the decision point at which the immunogenicity is is not too high, and if it seems higher, how might you address it? Well, fortunately, I'm not um, making those decisions. <laughs> Would probably be um, point number one because it is a difficult decision. I mean, it's the it's the issue with I think any of these questions of unwanted effects is you're going in with data from animal models. Mm -hmm. And even though non-human primates are, you know, close to humans, they're not going to, you know, tolerate things in the same way. Um, and, and that's been established in many different uh, drug models over, over the years. So what is acceptable? And it's, it's also the kind of situation where we've never done the experiment where we take something that's a little too immunogenic in an NHP and put that in a human to see what happens because it's also entirely possible that we would see reductions in the human. I mean, we, we, we just don't really know. So I don't think I have a good answer for you in terms of how much is too much. Okay. Dr. Yeah. Carlos would know more about that than me. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I think in the case so much was being de delivered to the liver that it was probably advantageous no matter what. But um, in the case of, um, I mean, when the trials are done, often they're done with stage dosing, right? So that you see a low dose is not giving too bad. You give a little bit more. If it's shown a therapeutic effect, it's kind of like in a, it's almost an adaptive trial or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was curious to know, you're talking about these EVs that are emerging from the, you know, from the macrophages and go out to do a better job. Um, 
you know, we talk all the time about, about what kind of proteins are picked up by uh, lipid nanoparticles as they circulate. What mm -hmm. kind of proteins do you think are picked up by EVs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good question. And when we, so I did not show this data, but if we were to do that same experiment where we collect EVs and then do an IV injection, they go to the liver. You know, so at the end of the day, I mean, particularly if these EVs have repackaged some of our ionizable lipids, how different are they on a molecular level uh, than, you know, what we had in the first place? So we have not done protein corona analysis on, you know, these EVs yet. This is pretty recent work. And I think we could you know, we could do a decade of work to dig into this further. Um, as you may be aware, looking at protein coronas on soft materials can be challenging. We've recently been working with Marquita Landry, who's a chemical engineer at UC Berkeley. She's traditionally done protein corona analysis on hard materials, uh, carbon nanotubes, and we've been making some really nice progress in developing a new method to look at protein coronas, and we hope to also then apply that to EVs, but it's a great question. Thank you. Thanks for, for your answer. It's a great talk. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Stephen Street, and Stephen, uh, Marshall will um, make it possible for you to ask the question in person. Okay. Um, thank you. Sorry, someone's just started construction outside my house, which isn't useful, but um, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I had a question about the microfluidic particle preparation. Um, I was wondering how the different mixing technologies you use affect the properties of re the resulting lipid nanoparticles, and uh, mm -hmm. specifically, is there like a mixing technology that results in superior particles, or is it, or is the difference not that uh, great? This is also an in interesting question, and we have a paper coming out where we looked at uh, a number of different mixing parameters. So at the end of the day, for scale up, you're going to have to go with something that's controlled and reproducible. But when you're working with these fluidic systems, there are a lot of parameters that you can play with in terms of the speed of the different streams that you're introducing and some of these other ratios. So to find the optimal ratio, I think there are some guidelines as to where to start, but in our hands, um, the, the different types of particles, depending on their chemistry, might influence what is optimal in terms of expression in a mouse, so that's the caveat, uh, and you might have to play around with that a bit if you want optimal expression. We've observed something else that's interesting is that some chemistries when you make them with different mixing parameters, sometimes their efficacy, their total efficacy stays about the same. However, the organs in which they are expressing the protein can change. You can get shifts in, in expression that way. So we've worked mostly with our own lipidoids and it's, it's not clear, you know, will that be the case for all classes of lipids? There are always so many caveats when it comes to talking about lipid nanoparticle chemistry. But what I can say for sure is that the mixing method matters very much. 